We are in room 408. Mike Enslin was still standing in front of the Dolphin Hotel door, staring at the camera. He noticed the hotel manager sitting in a chair in the lobby. The moment their eyes met, Mike's heart sank. Shouldn't the lawyer have brought him along? But that was the only thought that crossed his mind as time passed. The hotel manager seemed determined to create a barrier between Mike and room 1408. As Mike stepped through the lobby door, Mr. Olin, the hotel manager, stood up, securing his seat and extending his hand towards Mike. The hotel was small but elegant. As Mike moved, a man dressed in a woman's outfit walked by, shifting a small bag in his left hand before extending his right hand to greet Mr. Olin. Soft music played from somewhere in the background. Good evening, Mr. Enslin, Olin said. How are you? Is there a problem? Olin's face showed a hint of unease. His eyes darted around the hotel lobby for a moment, as if searching for someone to save him. The hotel door opened, revealing a man and his wife asking for theater tickets. The receptionist was busy rebooking a room for a new tenant. Everyone seemed to be going about their business, as if they had all found the help they needed. Except for Olin, who had fallen into the writer's trap. He didn't know how to answer Mike's question. Mike repeated, Mr. Olin, what is the matter? Mr. Insulin, can I speak to you in my office for a moment, why not? All these details, when written, will put the reader in the mood and explain the black image in his imagination of room 1408. These are things that readers love. The receptionist assured Mike that the manager was really afraid of what could happen to him in room 1408. Yes, of course, we'll talk in your office. Olin reached for Mike's bag. Excuse me? Don't be shy. The bag only contains a change and a toothbrush. Are you sure? Yes. I'm actually wearing my favorite Hawaiian shirt. It helps me with the evil spirits. But Olin didn't smile at Mike's reaction. He was shocked and silent. He was a man in charge of the body. He was wearing a dark colored coat and a tie tied to his eye. All right, come with me. He walked in the hotel's hallway. He was showing hesitation. He was showing defeat. In the office room, which was mostly made of wood, Mike's manager seemed to have regained some of his confidence. The hotel was built in 1910. Mike didn't expect that the reviews would be written in the newspapers and the big magazines about what he would publish about the hotel, but he preferred to do the research well before writing it. The floor was covered with a luxurious Persian carpet. Two carpets were standing in the corners of the room. A light yellow light was shining on the place, and a third small carpet was on the office. Mike also saw copies of the last three books on the office floor. It's obvious that the manager had done his research before the interview. Mike sat on a chair in front of the office. He expected that the manager would take his seat behind the office, but the manager pulled the chair in front of him. He put his foot on his foot and opened the door on the office floor and asked Mike Cigar, Mr. Insulin? No, thank you. I don't smoke, Olin's eyes caught the cigarette behind Mike's ear. It was as if Mike was a traditional journalist who always had a cigarette stuck behind his ear under a newspaper label. This cigarette was a part of Mike. He didn't understand why Olin looked at him so surprisingly, but when he noticed, he laughed. He took the cigarette out of his ear, looked at it, and then looked at Olin. I haven't smoked a single cigarette for nine years. My older brother died of lung cancer, and I stopped as soon as he died. This cigarette behind my ear is a part of a memory and a part of a kind of a fad. I think like my tree shirt, for example. Or like people hanging on the wall above the office, a cigarette in a glass box with the words, in the case of emergencies, by the way, is it allowed to smoke in a room of 1408? I mean, in the case of a nuclear war, for example. Can I smoke? In fact, yes, it is allowed to smoke great. Isn't that something I have to worry about? The hotel manager laughed again a loud laugh, even though they were in the office room. And this is supposed to be his private safe place. Even when Mike visited him the day before and with a lawyer, Olin started to feel less nervous as soon as they entered the office room. Why not? How long would you feel under control if you didn't feel under control in your place? And the office is his place. The office is hung with old paintings on the walls, the proud carpet on the floor, and expensive cigarettes on the desk of the office. This room must have seen a lot of ups and downs before Olin, 
a lot of work agreements and deals since 1910 and until now. Are you sure there is nothing I can do to get this idea out of your mind? Unfortunately, no, Mike replied, and he puts the cigarette back in its place. This is the only similarity between him and those old journalists. The cigarette behind the ear. Olin, who changes his clothes every day. He never felt at the end of the day when he was smoking the cigarette any desire to smoke it, especially when he saw the effects of the sweat on it. How did he smoke 30 or 40 cigarettes a day 20 years before? This is a question he could never answer. Or the more correct question, why did he do that? Not how Olin put his hand on a pile of books and said, I wish from the bottom of my heart that you change your mind. Mike opened his bag and took out a small recording device. Are you ready to record this incident, Mr. Olin? Olin shook his hand and Mike pressed the record button. A small red light came on and the cow ran away. At that time, Olin was reading a book in the bookshelf, reading the headlines. As usual, when Mike sees copies of his books in someone's hand, he is overwhelmed with emotions, pride, confusion, challenge, and shame. There was no real reason to make him ashamed of his books, especially since it guaranteed him financial stability during the last five years. But for a moment, he regretted that he was using the recording device while Olin was pronouncing the titles of his books. Later, when he heard the recording, he couldn't help but laugh at the director's voice. While he was reading and without realizing it, Mike put his hand behind his ear, 10 nights in a residential house, 10 nights in a residential cell, 10 nights in 10 residential castles. He raised his eyes and Mike's eyes and a smile on his lips. Of course, I visited Scotland for this book and maybe Vienna too, and all travel expenses can be deducted from taxes, of course, right? The residential areas are your job in the first place. I want to say something. Are you sensitive about your books? Of course I am, but not to the point of weakness. Imagine that you can make me change my mind just by criticizing my books like that. No, no, not at all. I didn't mean to. It's just curiosity. I sent someone to buy all the books two days ago as soon as I received your offer. That was a request, not an offer. And it's still my request and it won't change. And as the lawyer said, and as the law states, you don't have the right to stop me from staying in a particular room, in the hotel, if I ordered this room. The room is not occupied. Room 1408 is not occupied. In fact, room 1408 is never occupied. But his words couldn't distract Mr. Olin from the last three books for Mike, which were classified as the best-selling book for the New York Times. He simply flipped through the books for the third time. The light beige light shone on the cover. The purple used a lot in the cover design. Psychoanalysis is very suitable for horror books. That's what the publisher said to Mike. Unfortunately, I can't look at the books for more than a few hours. I was very busy. I'm always busy. The hotel is small compared to New York, but we have more than 90% of the time. And probably, a new problem will arise with every new book, like a problem with me. Mr. Olin smiled. No, I can say that you are a little bit different, especially after your visit with the lawyer and all your threats. This sentence bothered Mike. He didn't threaten him in any way, unless the manager considered the presence of the lawyer a threat Mike had to bring a lawyer. But just like anyone, he used a key to open the door. Mike was forced to bring a lawyer with him. But like anyone, he had to use keys to unlock an old rusty box. He no longer had the key. With this idea, he had another one. In this case, he didn't own the alleged box. But the state law says the opposite clearly. If you want to take room 1408, that's your right, as long as no one else asks for it first. He noticed that Olin was watching him. He still had that sad smile on his face, as if he was listening to Mike's inner dialogue, word for word. It was an uncomfortable feeling. Mike began to feel that the whole interview was uncomfortable. He felt that as soon as he turned on the recording device, which usually shakes the other side, he was in a defensive position. Mr. Olin, I feel that you want to say something. And honestly, I can't say it. Forgive me, it's been a long day. If we talk about room 1408, please allow me to take the room now and... I read some of the, uh, what do you call them? Articles? Notes? Mike used to call them the sources of quick income. 
But he wouldn't say that, and the recording device was on. Although, this recording device is his. Ah, stories. Yes. I read a story from every book. I mean, I read the story of the house of Trelsby the Resident, from the book The Resident's House. Yes, yes, the one about the clown. The clown that the Trelsby family killed, made up of six people, and we still don't know who he is. Yes, exactly. I also read the story about the night you spent in the cemetery in Alaska, about the grave of the two murderers, and I also read your testimony about the night you spent in Gatsby Castle. This was very interesting. I was amazed, to be honest. Mike was well trained to pick up any joke about his books and sometimes he was embarrassed to hear a joke, although it wasn't always true. Over time, Mike discovered that no one in the world suffers from paranoia as much as a writer who doubts himself all the time. But this time, he didn't feel any ridicule or contempt for the director of the hotel. Thank you. And he looked at the red light in the recording device. He was always embarrassed that it was a eye watching the other side all the time, waiting for it to write. But now he felt like this eye was watching him. No, this is serious talk, by the way. I intend to read more, but because I liked her book. I was surprised that she found me laughing at your adventure of not being a writer in Gatsby Castle. I was surprised that her book was so beautiful and calm. At first I thought it was a violent, bloody commercial book. Mike was ready to comment, which would come later. What about a girl like you in a place like this now? But the truth is, books are scary too. If I hadn't read a little bit of them, I probably wouldn't have cared to meet you like I did today. When I saw you bringing the lawyer and he took his bag, I understood that there was nothing I could do to make you remove the idea of the cursed room from your mind. But when I started reading the books, Mike reached out and turned off the recorder. The red light was really starting to get on his nerves. Do you want to know what made me reach the hall and write about these things? Is that what you were doing when you read the books? I think you write about these things to make money. And I never said you were in the hall, dear. It's strange that you're expecting me to write about this. Mike started to feel the heat on his face. The interview didn't go as he'd expected. He'd never turned off a recorder like this before in the middle of a conversation. But the director was unexpected. He was in control of the flow of the conversation. What scared me was that I discovered that I was reading to a person who was obviously literate and talented and didn't believe a single thing he wrote about. This wasn't true at all. Mike wrote at least two stories that he was convinced were real and published several of them. At the beginning of his stay in New York and during his first 18 months, he wrote a lot about things he believed to be real. But did he really believe that Eugene Rails with his head cut off was really walking around in an abandoned farm in Kansas under the moonlight? No, he spent the night in the farm. The only scary thing he saw was the oven. He spent a very hot summer night in a castle in Transylvania the Wallachian flask was supposed to still be there, but the only blood stain he saw that night was the spooky mouse. The night he spent at the grave of the serial killer Jeffrey Dahmer was like seeing a man who was out at 2 a.m. holding a knife. But the nightmare's friends laughed, and the plot was revealed. And so the disguise wasn't perfect. Mike knew the difference between a real ghost and a teenager holding a rubber knife. But he wasn't ready to share his thoughts with Olin but he remembered that he had turned off the recording device, and since the interview was no longer recorded, he could have said anything. Other than that, he was starting to like Olin's mentality, and when you like someone, you're ready to tell them the whole truth. No, I don't believe in ghosts, giant monsters, and the like. And thank God these things don't exist, because there wouldn't be anything to protect us from them if they were real. But I decided from the start to keep my mind open, and not to be afraid. And I know I never won the Pulitzer Prize because I wrote about the ghost that appeared in Mount Hope's grave, but if I had met that ghost, I would have written about it with all honesty. Olin said something very low, one word that Mike couldn't distinguish. Sorry, I didn't hear what you said. I was saying no, Mike refutes. Olin definitely thinks he's a liar. When it comes to this point, it's best to end the discussion. Mr. Olin, can we continue this discussion another time? I'd rather leave the room now if you don't mind. Who knows, maybe when I leave and enter the room I'll see a ghost standing behind me in the mirror while I brush my teeth. And Mike started to get up from his chair. 
Olin raised his hand to stop him. I'm not accusing you of lying, my dear, but you don't believe. And ghosts rarely appear until they are not believed to exist. It could be that Eugene Rilspe was walking in front of you all the time, and you were spending the night in his farm, but you didn't see him. Mike stopped and raised his hand to remove the bag. Okay, if that's the case, there's no reason for us to leave room 1408, right? No, there's a reason to leave. You have to leave. There are no ghosts in room 1408. But there's something... There's something else other than ghosts. I myself felt this thing. Not believing in ghosts can protect you from seeing them if you're staying in an abandoned house or an old castle. But not believing in ghosts is what will make you more susceptible to danger in room 1408. Please, Mr. Insler, please don't. I waited for you today to ask you, no, to beg you not to leave this room. Mike, this person who wrote these beautiful books about the life of ghosts doesn't deserve to be there. Mike heard the director's words, but he didn't hear them at the same time. He was angry with himself. And you turned off the recording device? You feel embarrassed until you turn off the recording device, and then he talks to you like this about the room and you don't record a word. Okay, it doesn't matter. Take his words from the memo in the article. If he wants to raise a case on me after that, he's free to do so. He couldn't wait to leave the room. Not only because he wanted to get rid of this stupid task of spending a boring night in the room, but also because he wanted to remember what the director said before he forgot. Have a drink, Mr. Insler. No, no, please. The director put his hand on his pocket and pulled out a key hanging on a long bronze medal. The bronze looked old, rusty, and pale. The number was 1408. Please give me just 10 minutes of your time. We'll have a drink together. Then you can take the key. I was almost ready to do anything to change your mind. But that's it. I understand very well now that this is a matter of course. You still use real keys in this hotel? I swear it's a nice touch. Actually, no. All the rooms in the hotel have been open since 1979, the year I was the manager. 1408 is the only room that is still open with a key. There was no need to change the lock or change the door. The room was always empty. The last time the manager came in was in 1978. You're joking. Mike sat down and took out the recording device and turned it on again and said, according to the manager, Mr. Olin, room 1408 was not occupied by anyone during the last 20 years. We didn't try to install a modern lock on the door of the room because we knew it wouldn't work. The digital clocks don't work in the room. Sometimes the time goes by in the back. Digital clocks don't work in this room. Sometimes the clock goes backwards and sometimes it stops completely. The important thing is that you won't be able to know the time with a digital clock in this room. Same thing for calculators or mobile phones. And if you use a beeper, Mr. Enslin, I also advise you to turn it off before entering the room. Because once you enter, it will start to beep for no reason, and it will stop for a moment, and then continue. And even if you turn off the device, unfortunately, it doesn't guarantee anything. It can start by itself again. The only effective treatment is to remove the battery, and stretch your hand, and turn off the device. In fact, Mr. Enslin, the only effective treatment is to not enter this room at all. No, I can't, and stretch my hand and remove the recording device again. The only thing I can do is to accept the drink you offered me a while ago. And while the manager was pouring the drink in front of a small bar under an oil painting on the wall, Mike asked, you say that this room was not inhabited since 1978. How did you know that the electronics are damaged in this room? I didn't say that no one entered the room at all since 1978. I mean, at least once a month, one of the housekeeping staff has to enter the room to give it a quick cleaning. I mean, Mike had been working on his new book for four months, 10 rooms, hotels, and a residence quick cleaning of an unoccupied room like opening the windows to get fresh air dust removal and so on. Maybe the only thing that doesn't happen in this quick cleaning is changing the shelves. And he asked himself if he should have brought his shelves or a sleeping bag Olin had just returned from the bar. And it seemed like he was reading Mike's thoughts. By the way, we changed the shelves today. Mr. Enslin, enough about Mr. Enslin, you can call me Mike. No, please don't call me that. That I won't be comfortable with that, here you go to your health and to your health, no. Mr. Enslin today, to your health alone, you need this today more than anyone else. Okay. To my health, you know, Mr. Olin, you're in the middle of a horror film. The wise man who appears in the film to warn his heroes in the dark about the entrance of the castle of the dead. Luckily for me, I didn't take this role. 
that often, I haven't yet entered the rules of the internet that talk about the places of residence or the strange phenomena, and this will change when I finish my book. This is what Mike thought about while taking a sip from his glass. Even the tourist tours that go around the places of residence in New York have no knowledge about this room. We tried as much as we could to keep this secret well. Although the date is written and available to any accurate researcher, Mike allowed himself a smile. Veronica, the worker, changed the shelves. I entered the room with her myself. Veronica and her sister have been working here since 1971 or 1972, approximately one of the oldest workers in the hotel. I'm the oldest, personally, in six years, and she was a maid until she became the head of the housekeeping. I think this is the first time she has changed the shelves by herself in six years. Approximately, you should be proud of yourself, Mr. Enslam. It's like someone from the royal family changing the shelves by himself. Veronica and her sister, the worker, who died in 1992, were changing the shelves to clean this room. Maybe the link between the two sisters made them... What's the word? Yes, yes, it's like they have a ban against the room, 1408 a ban, that is enforced at a certain time. They can only give it a quick clean. Please don't tell me her sister died of a terrible death because of the room, no. Not at all. Her sister quit her job in 1988 for health reasons, even though you didn't believe that the room has a connection to her physical and psychological deterioration. We have reached a good stage of understanding, Mr. Olin, and I'm sorry. I'm afraid to ruin this understanding. If I say I think all this is nonsense, you are very stubborn even though you are a researcher in the field of paper. The readers have the right to doubt everything. I think I could have left the room 1408 as it is locked, it never opens, the light is off, and the curtain is back so the sun doesn't change the color of everything in the room. But I couldn't bear the idea of the air in the room as if it was an abandoned storage. I couldn't bear the idea of the dust layers that would accumulate on each floor. In my opinion, I was more confused than necessary, wasn't I? Mm. No, not at all. You are the manager of the hotel, and this is your job anyway. The twin sisters were able to clean this room in a very short time. Then one of them passed away, and the other left the job. So I chose two other employees to do this job, I always choose two who have a very good relationship to enter the room, hoping that the connection between them protects them exactly. And you have the right to laugh at all this at your convenience, Mr. Enslin. But you will feel that there is something in the room as soon as you enter it. I'm sure of that whoever lives in this room is not shy at all. I used to enter the room a lot with the employees to supervise the cleaning. And most importantly, to get them out of the room if something happened until now, nothing happened. There were rare cases where some of them entered the room with a sudden burst of tears for no reason. And in other cases, they entered the room with a hysterical burst of laughter. I don't know how someone can laugh for no reason, and without controlling himself, he can be more scary than someone who cries for no reason. But it's true, some of them were in a state of deep silence. Besides that, I don't think anything important happened during the past years. I used to keep them in this room with some initial experiments, with mobile phones, digital devices, and the like. Despite my observations regarding digital devices, nothing happened. And thank God for that. The manager stopped talking for a second, and then he said one of them fainted. Yes, fainted. Her name was Romy Van Gilder. She was cleaning the floor on the TV, and suddenly she started screaming. I asked her, what's wrong? She threw the dustbin out of her hand and put her hands on her eyes and screamed. She screamed and said that she fainted, that she couldn't see anything but a mixture of colors. And that's it. As soon as I took her out of the room, the colors disappeared. And until she got to the elevator, her vision returned to her. Are you trying to scare me with this? Is this what you're trying to do now? Mr. Olin, of course not. You know the history of the room that started with the first suicide that I mentioned. Mike knew this information. Kevin O'Malley, a tailor who committed suicide on October 13th, 1910, he jumped out of the window and left behind a bucket and seven children, five men, five men and one woman. All of them jumped out of the window. Mr. Enslin, three women and one man, died of a high fever from the sedatives. And two were found in the bed and two were found in the bathroom and one committed suicide in 1970. Another one after he cut his hand, cut his genitals. What I want to say, 
Mr. Enslin, is that if all these stories didn't scare you out of the room, then of course my stories about the servants who cleaned the room won't succeed in this mission. The servants who stopped to enter this room are very few more than a few except for the two sisters. Exactly Mike wasn't very interested in the stories of the cleaners, and he was a bit annoyed by the mention of the suicide director. As if Mike didn't know what happened or didn't know the essence of this suicide, except that in fact it doesn't have any essence. Abraham Lincoln and John Kennedy both had their deputies named Johnson, whose names are composed of seven letters. Lincoln was elected in 1860 and Kennedy in 1960. What is the point of these similarities? Nothing. These suicide stories will be very useful in the book, of course, but since the recording device is off, let me tell you my real opinion. These stories are not evidence of anything in general, Mr. Enslin. Listen to me carefully. Please, the twin sister, after leaving the hotel, died of a heart attack before that. The Alzheimer's disease was already destroying her mind, even though she was very young at that time, and let us also remember that her sister is still working in the hotel, and her health is still good. That's a success story. And you too. How many times did you enter the room? A hundred times? Two hundred? And I also see you sitting in front of me well and healthy, but that's... You seem to be sitting in front of me in a good and healthy way. But that's only for a few short moments I enter and exit at once. It's like entering a room full of drawers. As long as you're holding your breath, you'll be safe. Haha. <laughs> It's obvious you're not convinced of this similarity, but I see it as the closest thing to reality. And it's also possible that the reactions towards any person in this room are different from one another in their severity and violence. Since this hotel was built about a century ago, and every hotel staff knows that this room is designated, it's now an integral part of the building's history. But no one talks about it. Just like no one mentions the fact that the 14th floor in every hotel is actually the 13th floor, but we change its number because of the flying. And if we had more information about this room, we might have been able to draw a bigger picture, and it would have been a more scary picture than your reader's ability to guess. I remember that every hotel in New York has had suicide cases. That's a fact. But I see it with my own eyes, that there's nothing but this hotel that has had more than a dozen suicide cases in just one room. That's not a suicide case. And what we're going to argue about is that they were suicide cases. How many cases were those? 30 cases. At least 30 or... That's all we know, Mike asked, and he noticed that the idea of a suicide case in room 1408 has never been a threat to him before. He always thinks about suicide or violent death. Are you lying? He said the words before he thought, No, Mr. Insulin, I assure you that I'm not lying. You think that we decided to close this room because of pessimism or because of myths and legends that say that every hotel has a ghost, isn't that so? Mike noticed that this idea, the idea that every place has a ghost, is exactly the idea of a series of books ten nights in a row. And this joke in Olin's voice made him feel a little embarrassed. In the hotel business, of course, there are myths and strange beliefs, but we don't let them affect the workflow. The most important thing is that there's nothing that makes a room stay unoccupied. There's a room available, and there's a guest, so the room stays. The only exception was room 1408, a room in the 13th floor, and the number of rooms on the door, also 13. The manager looked at Mike and continued, this is not just a room with suicide cases. No, there are cases of heart attacks, heart attacks, a stroke. There's a 1973 man who drowned in a soup dish in front of him, and you have the right to see all this nonsense. But I spoke to the manager at the time, and he confirmed that he had read the criminal medicine report. The power of this room stays is almost silent. During the afternoon, this is the time when the room is cleaned. And despite that, there are cases of heart attacks, stroke, diabetes. Three years ago, there was a problem with heating in more than one room. Room 1408 was one of them. He did the maintenance and went in and out. Nothing happened to him. He didn't notice anything. But the next day, he died of a stroke. Coincidence. But Mike couldn't deny Olin's skills. If he had been in charge of the student camps, he would have been able to scare the students during the scary moments around the fire at night. Coincidence, Mike didn't hesitate and didn't react. He reached out his hand to the old key. 
What's the matter with you, Mr. Insulin? Blood pressure, any psychological problems? Mike felt that his hand was resisting moving towards the key, but as soon as he succeeded in moving it, it extended to the key. I'm very healthy. He held the big bronze medal and said, this is just my lucky tree shirt, Mike's story. The principal insisted that Mike take him to room 14, but Mike didn't. He noticed that as soon as they left the library room on their way to the elevator, the principal turned back to the same person he was in the beginning. Mr. Olin, the simple, humble, poor man, lost his shirt he was wearing in his office. He stopped them on the street. Wearing a dress, Mike realized that he was the principal. He gave the principal a piece of paper. The principal saw it and got angry. He left after thanking the principal. On their way, Mr. Olin asked Mike to give him the bag. Mike refused again, and they got on the elevator. Mike was on the top row, the 11th, 12th, and 14th rows. Mike thought of the number 13 as a joke. It doesn't mean that the 13th row isn't there anymore, that's a joke, but he knew that it's something that happens in almost every elevator in the world. The elevator moved. I'm curious about one thing. Why didn't you think of the 1408 room? If you're so afraid of the room, you could have said that you're staying in the room to avoid the requests to stay in it. Maybe I was afraid of being accused of being a thief if I'm not a federal government employee and a quality follower in the elevators, then I'm a workaholic, the owners of the elevators. For them, it's an empty room in the hotel and it's a good place to stay. They won't be convinced that just jumping from the window to the street is enough to get them out of the market. For Mike, this was the most annoying thing Olin had ever said. He stopped trying to convince him. He left all his ability to convince him in the office. When they got out of it, the number 12 light was on in the elevator, and he got out and it turned off, and the number 14 light was on. The elevator stopped, the door opened, and the empty road to the 14th floor appeared in the golden red carpet that covered the whole road. Now we're here. Excuse me, I can't continue with you any further. You'll find your room on the left at the end of the road. If there's no need to go there, I've never been so close to a room. Since that day, Mike got out of the elevator and he felt his legs were heavier than usual. He turned around and looked at Olin, a short man, relatively full. His coat was black and his white socks were tied up. His hands were now with a room behind his back. And Mike noticed that his face was very pale. He started to sweat. He started noticing his empty forehead. There's a phone in the room, of course. You can use it if you feel something's wrong, but I doubt it'll work. If the room doesn't want to work, it won't happen. Mike thought in a nice response. If the phone doesn't work, will there be a discount on the price of the night? But his tongue was as heavy as his legs. He refused to move. Olin reached out to Mike, Mr. Eslin, Mike. Please, please don't enter this room, please. But the elevator door was closed and he didn't speak. Mike stood still for a moment, in complete silence. In the way of the New York Hotel. In the role that no one in the hotel admitted to, that is actually the 13th role. For a moment he thought to reach out and push the elevator's call button, but he didn't. If he did... Olin would have won. And the worst thing is that the most important chapter in his next book won't be written. Of course, the readers won't know the truth. His lawyer and the author of the book won't know either. The lawyer probably won't know either, but he'll know. But the elevator didn't work. He reached out to the cigarette behind his ear and made a reckless move that he couldn't remember. He threw his shirt and started moving towards room 1408. 11 minutes of recording on the small recorder. This is the most important recording that Mike Insulin left after he made the mistake in room 1408, which lasted about 70 minutes. The recorder was a little burned, but it wasn't completely damaged. The strangest thing in the recording was the lack of Mike's comments and its oddity. The recorder was a gift from his wife five years ago. At that time, during his exploratory visits, he was used to taking five cards with him and five tapes to mark his notes and a leather bag full of bullet wounds, but as time went by until he entered room 1408, the number changed. He took one bullet, one tape, and five tapes of cassette tapes to record the tape for 90 minutes. In addition to the tape, he put in the recorder before he left his apartment. He found out that the small recorder was a gift from his wife.
he discovered that voice recording to record his notes was easier than writing, specifically to record important moments, some of which were really enjoyable, like the sound of a butterfly that suddenly flew in his direction while he was visiting Gertzby Castle, for example, the day he screamed like a child entering a haunted house for the first time. His friends loved this story a lot. The small record player worked much more than writing, especially if he wanted to record events like the night he spent in the cemetery and the rain that never stops. It was impossible for him to write notes in such circumstances. Over the years and with his exploratory journeys, this small record player became his friend. Until now, he has never recorded a testimony to real events. But he was not surprised that his feelings towards the small record player reached a point where he considered it a friend. All artists are like this. The writer is attached to a certain pen or pencil, even if it is worn out. The cleaning lady is attached to a certain cleaning tool. The microphone was like a garlic belt and a cross for the blood donors, although he never saw a real resemblance to this device. His problem with the room 1408 began before he even entered it. The first observation was that the room door was slightly tilted to the left. The directors of horror movies thought about this when they tilted the camera a little to reflect the psychological stress in the film. The view of the door gave him another impression. They thought about your feeling when you are on a boat in a stormy sea, when the doors are tilted to the right and left, to the front and back, until you start feeling the rotation in your mind and in your stomach. But he did not feel the rotation because of the shape of the door. No, he did feel it just a little. He bent over and took the recording device out of the bag. His feeling of rotation almost disappeared as soon as he looked away from the door. He took the device and started getting ready to record this moment. The room door 1408 sends me a special greeting. The door seems to be slightly tilted to the left, but he only said, the door, and that's it. If you listen to this tape, you will hear the word door, and then a click sound when the recording device stopped because the door was not tilted. The door was perfectly level in the correct position in front of it. Mike turned around and looked at the room door 1409 on the other side of the road. Then he turned around again and looked at the door 1408. The two doors are level, white with a number written in gold and the corner of a golden door. The two doors are completely straight. He bent over and took his bag out with the same hand that he was holding the recording device with. He put his other hand with the key towards the door and left his place. The door was tilted again, this time slightly to the right. What is this nonsense? He muttered. While the feeling of the circle began again in his stomach, he remembered his only trip on a ship a few years ago, and he remembered his feeling of the circle. He remembered that he stayed in the bed that was shaking right and left all the time, feeling that he was about to fall, ah, all because of Olin. This is exactly what he wanted and succeeded in. He prepared you psychologically. He tricked you with the terrifying noises. Surely if he could see you now, he would have died of laughter. Surely if he... And his thoughts were cut off. Mike noticed that there was a possibility that Olin was really watching him now. He looked behind the door and towards the elevator, and again he noticed that as soon as he took his eyes off the door, his feeling of the circle ended. Above the elevator door, Mike noticed something he had expected, a small surveillance camera. There is someone who is one of the workers in the place, surely he is watching him now. And Mike seemed to be sure that Olin was sitting next to this person watching him, and the two of them are laughing. I'll teach him how to come here and bring me a lawyer. And the security guard who was sitting next to him behind the surveillance screen responded to him. He looks terrified. He looks like he's the ghost. And all of this while he still hasn't opened the door. You won over me, boss. No, I won't let them feel that they won over me. I entered the house of Rebli, the resident. I slept in the room where they killed him. I slept. I went to sleep. I spent the night next to the grave of Jeffrey Dahmer and the two nights at Lovecraft's grave personally. I brushed my teeth in the bathroom where Sir David Smith killed his twin brother. No, no, no. I'm not afraid of the stories of the ghosts, ladies and gentlemen. When he looked at the door again, the door was back to normal. He reached out his hand and put the key in the lock, and he looked around. The door opened. Mike took a step into the room. The door didn't do what it does in these situations. It didn't move from its position and close behind it like it does in horror movies. 
dark darkness in the room, except for the faraway lights from the nearby building windows. The lights came from the window glass of the room. Mike reached out his hand and looked for the light buttons. He found the buttons and he pressed them. Light was sent from the fingers hanging from the ceiling surrounded by crystal and from long sparkles in the corner of the room. The window was above the office. Anyone who sits and writes in this place can, during their break, look out of the window while writing or jump out of the window if they feel the need to jump out of the window. Mike put down his bag and closed the door. He pressed the record button and the red light in the device lit up. According to Mr. Olin, there are six people who jumped out of the window I'm looking at now, but I don't intend to jump from the 14th floor. I mean the 13th floor. Apart from that, there's a metal frame on the window, outside, for protection. Oh, security first. Room 1408 can be considered a small wing in the hotel. The room I'm in now has two chairs, a sofa, a desk, a closed closet with a TV, and maybe a mini bar. The carpet on the floor is simple, not as luxurious as the Persian carpet in the director's office. The walls are covered with wallpapers, and, and what's that? The record player will hear a click sound in these moments because Mike stopped recording again. The comments on the record are generally the same pattern, broken pieces. This is unusual and it hasn't happened in the 150 records he recorded before. His voice was also clearly out of focus. It's not the voice of a person who works and he's looking at his notes as if he were a distracted person and he's talking to himself without noticing he's doing this. These disturbing recordings and the lack of focus and the noise of his voice make most people who hear the record unable to continue to the end. A feeling of unrest. A feeling that the person who recorded the record is losing his mind, or at least losing his connection to reality. The broken, distorted words give the feeling that something is happening. What Mike noticed before he stopped recording were the pictures hanging on the walls of the room. Three pictures. A picture of a woman in her 20s, wearing a pink dress, standing on the stairs. A picture of a religious ship, a painting of a silent nature, island. A fruit, painted in an ugly orange color. An apple, an orange, and a banana. The three pictures are highlighted. Three distorted pictures. He was hanging the pictures on the wall, but why? What's so strange about the three distorted pictures? The door being distorted, yes, it's strange, but the door wasn't distorted, it was just moving. His eyes were deceiving him, nothing more. The picture of the woman standing on the stairs, tilted to the left, and the picture of the ship as well. The picture of the British Navy watching the floating fish in the sea. The silent nature, which seemed to Mike to be drawn in the light of a scorching sun, was tilted to the right. Mike was not suffering from depression, but he was adjusting the picture. Looking at them while they were tilted like this was like hitting them with a pickaxe. And that wasn't surprising. As soon as a person is prepared for the feeling of a pickaxe, he will feel it. When he was traveling, he was told that if he could resist for a while, he would get used to it. Mike didn't travel far enough to get used to the feeling, nor did he care to travel. The picture's glass was covered with a layer of dust. His hard time with the glass of the silent nature drew two lines on the dust. The dust had a greasy, sticky touch, as if it was silk at the aging stage. That's what he remembered, but that's not a note on a tape. I already know how the silk touch is getting worse. He adjusted the picture and took a step back to look at them. The picture of the woman in her twenties next to the door leading to the bedroom. The picture of the ship to the north of the office. Finally, the ugly picture of the fruits next to the TV cabinet. Some of him thought that when he looked at them again, he would find them tilted again, or that they would move and tilt, and he would look at them. Things like this happen in movies like The House of the Snowy Man, or a scene from a series about the Aurora, for the picture remained fixed on its state as he adjusted it. He thought that even if this had happened, he wouldn't be surprised, nor would this be a sign of anything strange, that's just the nature of things. He touched the cigarette behind his ear and thought that the smokers he had stopped would stay there for a long time and would want to go back. These pictures are hanging on the wall since Nixon was president. Of course, they will want to tilt again. He thought that these pictures had been here for a long time. These pictures are hanging on the wall from the time Nixon was president. Of course, 
It will be a long time ago. He thought these pictures would have been here for a long time. If you lift them now from the walls, you will see the color of the wallpaper a little lighter than the rest of the wall. Or maybe you will see insects running away quickly, like what happens when you lift a big stone from the ground. This idea was disturbing and annoying for him. Imagine insects, white and blind, coming out of these pictures when he moves them. He put the tape recorder in front of him and pressed the button. He said, Oh, Olin really affected my way of thinking. He wanted to scare me and he succeeded. I have to try to control myself a little. This sentence on the tape was printed with the sound of a click. The recording was over. He closed his eyes and took four deep breaths. He held every breath for five seconds before exhaling. Nothing like this has ever happened to him before in the house, unless it was supposed to be a residential area, not even in the cemeteries and castles that are said to be residential. The feeling now was not that he was in a residential place, but as if he were under the influence of cheap drugs. Olin is the reason. Your sleep is magnetically. But you will wake up and spend the whole night in this damn room this is the best place I've ever visited to write about him. Get Olin out of the subject, and you'll have a piece to write ghost stories for 10 years. Olin can't win. He and his friends are not among the 30 people who died here. The whole thing is in my hands now. Breathe, inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale. It was dressed like a traditional one, with a lining on the shoulder and a curtain. In the picture, there were also cars of old models walking in the street in front of the hotel. The cabriolet and the vacuum cleaner seems to have been around since 1955. And what is this cabriolet? He put it in his pocket, with his shirt and his tree. I will keep it as a souvenir. And now, it is time for the clean air. On the tape, there is a noise when he puts the tape on the desk, usually the desk of the office. Then there is a moment of silence. Then there are far-off voices of a person trying and putting in a lot of effort in a difficult job. Then, there is a moment of silence again. Then, there is a faint voice and Mike says, I did it. This was a bit far from Mike. But he gets closer to Mike, he lifts him from the desk and he speaks. I did it. The lower part of the window was not ready to respond. It was as if it was choked with nails. But the upper part was not a problem. Now I can hear the traffic noise in the street and all the car noises. The sounds are very comfortable for me right now. There's a sound of someone playing the saxophone in the street, probably in front of the plaza, a few blocks away. It reminds me of my brother. And he stops talking. The red light in the tape was on. It was as if it was an eye looking at him with a threat. Your brother? Your brother is dead. Mike Insulin fell in the smoke war. What do you mean? We are all in war. Mike Insulin always wins in every battle but Donald Inslin. In fact, my brother had diabetes a long time ago during the harsh winter on the highway to Connecticut. He laughed and closed the tape. There are still other recordings on the tape after this sentence, but this was the last sentence he understood. The last sentence may have meaning. Mike turned around and looked at the photos again. They were still attached correctly. Nice photos, but this silent nature was an ugly drawing in an annoying way. He pressed the record button and said two words, and that's it. Portuguese smoke. He closed the tape. He walked through the room towards the bedroom door. He stood for a moment in front of the picture of the woman hanging by the door. Then he reached out his hand in the dark of the room, looking for the light button. A moment's impression was in his mind at the time. A strange feeling as if he were skin. Old, dead skin. There was something wrong with what he touched the wall under his hand. But he found the light button and the yellow light immersed the bedroom from another cloud in the ceiling, a large double-decker bed covered with yellow-orange tiles. Why are you hiding? He turned off the recorder and stopped the tape. He entered the room. He was amazed at the colors of the desert bed covers and the wrinkles of the pillows under the pillow. Should I sleep here? No, 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 thanks. It's as if I'm going to sleep inside this annoying, silent nature. He pressed the record button again and said, Orpheus on the Orpheum circuit. He turned off the tape and walked to the bed. The bed was covered in yellow-orange. It was probably bright during the day, but now the colors of the bed reflected. 
There was a small bedside table on each side of the bed, a large black phone with a chain on it. The phone's chain opened as if it were wide, amazing eyes. On the other side of the table, there was a small plate with a plum blossom on it. Mike pressed the record button. This is not a real plum blossom. This is definitely plastic. He stopped the tape again. On the bed itself, there was the hotel's menu. Mike approached it, trying to make sure he didn't touch anything on the bed, and he held the menu. But his nails touched the bed, and Mike's voice was annoying. The touch was soft in a terrible way and a wrong way. But he picked up the menu and looked at it. It was written in French, and Mike doesn't know French. A thousand types of breakfast were birds fried in jars. At least that's something I believe French people eat. He thought about it and he smiled. When he opened his eyes again, the menu was in Russian. He opened his eyes again. It was written in Italian. He opened his eyes again. There was no menu at all. There was a picture drawn on the board, a boy looking at it with horror and a wolf licking the boy's feet to the bone. And the wolf behind him looked like a dog enjoying his favorite game. I don't see that. The idea was in Mike's head. And of course, he really didn't see that. Without closing his eyes this time, he saw in his hand a menu written in English, clearly in Russian. Each line had a type of egg, waffles, fruits. There were no birds fried in jars or anything. He looked around and slowly walked out of the small space between the wall and the bed, a space that he felt as if it were a grave. His heart beat so fast that he felt a punch in his neck, a bruise on his hand and chest, a terrible pain in his eye there was something wrong in 1408. He was told that it was like entering a room with poisonous gas. And that's exactly what Mike felt. As if someone forced him to inhale a mixture of drugs and insects. I'm sure that's why he did that. He's laughing now at his security colleagues watching him. He must have entered the room with the poisonous gas through the ventilation openings. And it doesn't mean that Mike doesn't see that there are no ventilation openings in the room. Mike looked around in horror. There was no light on the bed or the bedside table. The table was completely empty. He turned around to the door leading to the living room and left his place. There was a picture hanging by the door. He wasn't sure that there was a picture in the room when he entered. At that moment, he wasn't sure of anything. But he was almost sure that there was no picture hanging by the door. And the picture was a silent nature. A small layer of light on an old table and the light in the picture was yellowish-orange. I need to get out of here. He got excited and returned to the living room. He noticed the soft sound of his footsteps as if he was stepping on a hard surface. On the walls of the living room, the pictures were all tilted. The woman standing on the stairs was covered with blood. And Mike looked at her with a scary smile. Her teeth were like human flesh. The sailors disappeared from the picture. They were lined up with men and women. On the left, Near the front of the ship, there was a man standing. He was wearing a brown suit and a baton in his hand. Near the front of the ship, there was a man standing, wearing a brown suit instead of a blue one, holding a baton in his hand, with a shocking expression on his face. Mike knew this man's name, Kevin O'Malley. This was his first time in the room in 1408, the sewing machines that jumped out of the window in October 1910. Everyone next to O'Malley was a victim of this room, all of them were shocked faces, as if they were all members of the same family. In the silent nature painting, there was a picture of a severed head. The same orange-yellow light reflected on the curved edges, the dried lips, the eyes that looked dead, and the cigarette behind the right ear. Mike's nose was pointing towards the door, but his legs were barely moving. It felt like his feet were sticking to the floor with every step. And of course, the door wouldn't open. The door chain wasn't locked, and the door handle was moving in the right direction but the door wouldn't open. Mike returned to the room, breathing heavily towards the door. The window was open above the office. The curtains next to the window were moving, but he didn't feel any air, as if the room was breathing air as soon as he entered. He was still able to distinguish the sounds of the street bells, but now they were coming from far away. Was he still able to hear the sound of the saxophone coming from far away? But the room seemed to have stolen the beautiful sound, leaving a distorted sound, a low, scary sound, like the wind blowing through a dead person's neck, like the wind blowing through a glass window full of severed nails, or enough, enough. He tried to speak, but he couldn't. His heart was beating so fast. If the heart rate was higher than that, 
his heart could explode. The small recorder, his loyal friend on all his exploratory trips, was no longer in his hands. He left it somewhere, but he doesn't remember where. In his bedroom. Ah, his time is gone forever now. The room must have swallowed him. He might appear again in a picture of the pictures he's hanging. He put his hand on his chest, as if he was trying to calm his heartbeats, as if he was struggling to breathe, as if he had been through a long race. When he put his hand on his chest, he felt the touch of his stiff body to the small recorder in his shirt pocket. This feeling gave him a sense of reassurance, a sense of stability. He began to notice that, unconscious, he was humming a tune, and the room was humming with him, as if there were thousands of voices hidden behind the glass wall. He felt a terrible cough, as if his stomach was swelling. He felt the air next to him heavy and dusty. But despite that, he felt he was regaining control of himself. At least enough to try and ask for help, he was still able to do that. The idea that Olen would look at him with victory and say, I didn't tell you, didn't bother him at the time. The idea that Olen was the reason for all this and that he poisoned the room with gas and that he was hallucinating was a complete mind blow. The room was behind all that was happening, the room we saw. He was reaching his hand towards the large black phone in the office, a copy of the phone next to the bed in the bedroom, but his hand was not reaching fast. It was moving very slowly as if he were diving underwater to the point that he was afraid he would start seeing the air around him. He raised the speaker very slowly, while his other hand was moving very slowly, and was dialing the number zero on the phone. While his hand was pointing to the speaker, he heard the phone ringing, and was going back to his place after dialing the number. The sound was like the sound of a racing car in a racing show. Be careful, dear racer. If you don't know how to answer the question, you'll be left on the road to hell. He didn't hear the ringing of the phone in his ear. He only heard a rough sound and started talking. This is the ninth, the ninth, this is the ninth, the ninth, and this is the tenth, the tenth. We killed all your friends. All your friends are now dead. The sixth. The horror increased and Mike heard, not because of the words the voice was repeating, but because of the hollow look of the voice he was speaking to. It wasn't a machine voice, but it wasn't a human voice either. That was the sound of the room. The thing that lives in the room is leaking from the walls and the floor and is speaking from the phone. Something that has nothing to do or looks like any other experience I've had before. Something from another world. Something that hasn't arrived yet, but it's getting closer. Something very hungry. Where is dinner? Mike turned around. The phone's ringing and the wind was moving like a dandelion, like his stomach in his stomach. He was still hearing the sound out of the darkness. 18. It's 18 now. Take a breath when the alarm goes off. Four. It's four now. He wasn't aware that he was now putting his hand behind his ear and putting it in his mouth. He didn't feel that he was taking out a cigarette from his pocket, but the alarm went off and he decided to smoke. The room was starting to melt in front of him. The corners of the room were moving. They were turning into sharp, chaotic holes that looked painful to his eyes. The big canopy in the middle of the ceiling was shaking like a thick mass of slime. The photos were bending. In the photo next to the bedroom door, the woman started running up the stairs in a nervous movement as if she was in a silent movie. The sound from the phone was like the sound of an electric saw teaching him to speak. 18. It's eight now. The bedroom door and the main door were collapsing. They were expanding as if they were turning the entrance into a tunnel through another world. The light was changing, the brightness was increasing, the temperature was rising, the orange and yellow colors were filling the place. He saw that the wallpapers were cracking. The floor of the room was shaking, and he could hear his voice. The room was in 1408. He was getting closer. The man who lived inside the walls had a strange voice. Six. This is six. Yes. This is six. He looked at the cable car that had been taken from the cellar, the old hotel door, the old cars, and the words on the cable car's roof. He closed the roof before the explosion without thinking. Mike, a man who couldn't think, smelled the cabriolet's smoke and lit it up at the same moment the cigarette fell from his mouth. He brought the smoke from the cabriolet's cabinet and lit them all up at the same time with a loud, distinct sound. 
The moment he smelled the strong smell of the cabriolet, he went from his nose to his brain and was overwhelmed for a moment. Second, without thinking, he took off his cheap shirt, made in Korea or Cambodia. The stain immediately appeared on the old shirt and began to rise in front of his eyes. The room's image was distorted. Mike saw everything in front of him with a sudden awareness, like someone who was sleeping out of a nightmare, to be surprised that he was in a bigger nightmare. His thinking was clear at that moment, maybe because of the smell of the cabriolet or the sudden heat in his shirt, the word devil was distorted and strange, not even describing part of the scene. He was in a cave, in the middle of a desert full of tunnels and tunnels. The bedroom door turned into the burial room door in a cemetery. To his left, in the place where the image of the silent nature was hanging, the wall was sloping in his direction, filling the long cracks and gaps that opened up to another world, passing through it now in the direction of something Mike heard his breath and smelled a strange smell, as if it was the smell of the lion's den. His mind was cut off by the flame that began to burn his son's blood. The fire rose in front of his eyes and shook the whole world. While he began to smell the special smell of his hair burning, Mike left the room again in the direction of the door. The sound of a million insects in the wall and the yellow-orange light increased the intensity of the flame all the time, but this time when he reached the door and turned the corner, the door opened as if the thing that inhabited this room had lost its interest in a burning person, or as if it was not very interested in the grilled meat. There is a famous song that says that love can make the world spin, and that chance is often greater than love in real changes in the world. Rufus Durbin lived in the room 1414. The room was near the elevator. He was a salesman for a sewing machine. He came to New York to apply for a job in an executive position, about 90 years ago, when he first came down to the room in 1408, he jumped out of the window and another one, a salesman for a sewing machine, saved the room. Maybe this is exaggeration. Maybe Mike Insulin would have lived like this even if no one was present in the hallway of the hotel at that time. The fire that catches your shirt is not a simple thing, and it was probably going to be much worse if Durbin had not thought fast and moved faster. Although Durbin did not exactly remember what happened, he was able to make up a story that he would tell the journalists and in front of the TV cameras. He was happy with the idea of showing up in the hero's picture. This would surely help him get the job he came for. He clearly thought he saw someone holding fire running down the hallway of the hotel. Any further details were totally confused. It was impossible to remember the details precisely. Was completely confused. It was impossible to remember the details. The only thing he didn't tell any journalist because it was strange was that the man's screams were heard all the time. As if someone was raising his voice from a stereo, it was right in front of him. The sound of the scream didn't change, but the sound was changing, as if a high-pitched sound was coming closer all the time. Darburn was running on the road holding a bag full of snow. His shirt was burning. I noticed it immediately. That's what he told the journalist. He was running until he hit the door of the room in front of him and fell on his knees on the floor. That's the moment when Darburn reached it. He put his foot on the shoulder of the man screaming. He hit the carpet of the hotel's floor and took the contents of the bag he brought from the snow machine in the hotel. The details of these memories are vivid in his mind. He noticed that the light of the fire from the shirt was much bigger than usual. An orange light, yellow, strange. He thought about a trip he and his brother went to Australia for years, the amazing Australian desert, the giant rocks, the unimaginable temperature. The light on the man's face was like the sunset light on their faces in the desert at the time. It was like the light on his face was coming from somewhere else. He fell on his knees on the floor next to the man, who was no longer very burning. The man was covered with ice cubes. They pushed him to turn him over to put out the flames of the fire which was still attached to the shirt. The man's skin on the left side of his neck had turned red. The edges of his chest melted and deformed, but in contrast, Darburn looked up at the room the man had come from. Madness, something incomprehensible. The light came from behind the room's door, the same colors that Durbin had imagined from his trip, the yellow hot light of the deserted desert. Except for this terrifying light, he heard a voice as if he were talking to someone dear outside the door. 
For a moment, he felt like he wanted to open the door to go in and see what was behind it. Maybe Mike also saved Darburn's life. He was aware that Darburn was standing next to him, as if he suddenly lost his attention. He saw the terrifying light coming from the room's door reflected on Darburn's face. Mike thought these details very well, unlike Darburn. The room, the room, the room is quiet, as if Mike's words were a sedative. The room's door was closed in 1408 and the light was cut off. The terrifying light was cut off, which sounded like incomprehensible words. As soon as the light went out, Darburn's tailor was heading towards the elevator door and he rang the fire alarm. There is a picture of Mike Enslin in his book, The Treatment of Burn Victims, a personal approach. The 16th edition of the book is 16 months after Mike's quick stay in the room 1408. The picture is not obvious, only a part of it. But it is Mike's picture. Anyone who sees the picture will be able to distinguish it by the white square next to his left chest. The meat around this square is red, burning from the second degree in more than one place. The white square indicates the place where the shirt he was wearing that night was, the lucky tree shirt, and the pocket where the tape recorder was. The tape recorder was out of order, but it was still working. The tape was intact inside. The tape was the one that was not intact. After Mike's lawyer heard the tape three or four times, he threw it in a safe in his office and refused to admit the poems he had written on his shoulders. The tape remained in the safe since then. Mike's lawyer never felt any desire to listen to the tape again, or even to listen to a curious friend. Some of his curious friends were ready to commit a murder to let them listen to the tape. The cultural environment in New York is small, and words are quickly transferred. He was not comfortable with the sound of Mike on the tape. He was not comfortable with the recorded words. My brother died. A wolf ate him in the winter on the highway. What does this crazy word mean? Most importantly, he was not comfortable at all with the sounds on the tape. The sound was as if liquid was sticking, as if fabric was moving, and sometimes the sounds were as if they were not electric, and sometimes, strangely, as if a voice was speaking. While Mike was in the hospital, a man named Olin called Farrell and asked him to listen to the tape. Farrell refused. Olin left the lawyer's office and he praises God all the way that Mike did not sue him or the hotel for neglecting the right to leave. I tried to convince him not to go in. I tried to convince him. If anyone could be accused of neglecting tonight, Mr. Farrell, it would be Mr. Inslin personally. He did not believe in anything. He was unwise and unsafe. I think he will change his mind now. Although Farrell hated the tape, he wanted Mike to listen to it. It might be a source of inspiration for a new book. There is a good plot in what happened to Mike. Farrell knew this. It is not a chapter in a book, but a whole book. His sales could surpass all Mike's books. Of course, he was not convinced by Mike's words that he would not only stop writing about ghosts, but would stop writing at all. That is all there is to it. This is what makes a writer a writer. As for Mike Inslin, he was lucky in spite of everything. He knew this, he could have gotten burned worse. He did not have Mr. Durbin and his ice bucket. He could have had to undergo 30 or 40 surgeries instead of just four. Despite the surgeries, the scar remained on his left neck. The doctor told him that the scar would hurt over time. Although the burns were painful for weeks and months after he left the hotel, he understood well that it was necessary. If not for the ice bucket, he would have died in the room in 1408 like everyone else. The medical profession would often say that it was a heart attack or a mistake, but the reason would have been much more severe and cruel. No, this is easier. He was also lucky because he wrote three books about places he lived in before visiting a place he really lived in. His lawyer may not be convinced that he stopped writing, but it does not matter. Mike was convinced of this by the prosecutor. He could not even write a postcard without feeling dizzy and dizzy. Sometimes, just looking at a pen or a recorder made him think. The pictures on the walls. The pictures on the walls. I tried to fix them. He did not know what that meant. He did not remember the pictures. He did not remember most of the details of the room. He was happy with that. Forgetfulness is a mercy. His blood pressure was not good these days. The doctor told him that this happened sometimes to burn victims. He wrote a treatment. 
What does it mean that there are problems? The eye doctor wrote him a treatment. Permanent problems in the back, swelling in the prostate. He was happy with all these problems. He knew that he was not the first person to escape from room 1408, but he did not escape completely. He tried to be careful. His only mercy is that he does not remember the details. Sometimes nightmares visit him. In fact, a lot of them visit him every night, but he rarely remembers them when he wakes up. The feeling that things are floating in the corners of the place melts in the same way that the records are melted. When the weather is pleasant, sometimes he walks on the sea. The most time he remembers anything from the 70 minutes he spent in room 1408 was while walking on these. He was not a human being. He was not a human being at all. He said to himself as if he were facing the sea, the ghosts. The ghosts were human, at least in some days. But the things that were living in the walls of this room, maybe the situation will improve over time. He hopes that the situation will really improve. And maybe over time, all these memories will disappear as the melting on his neck disappears. But now he only sleeps when the light shines on his bedroom. Because when he wakes up from the nightmare while he is asleep, he can know where he is. He removes all the phones from the house. And it seems that in the deepest point of his mind, he is afraid that the phone will ring once and he will pick up the phone and hear a scary voice saying, wake up, wake up now, we killed all your friends. All your friends are dead now. And when the sun is shining on the sunset, it covers all the windows of the house. He sits in the darkness and waits for his time to make sure that the sun has completely disappeared. He can no longer bear the light of the sun at sunset, the yellowish orange light like the sunset light in the desert. We present it to you, room 1408, Stephen King's story.